Welcome to this week's edition of Ask an MS Expert. I'm John Strum, and I'm the host of the Real Talk MS podcast. Each week, Real Talk MS reaches thousands of people in more than 100 countries around the world with the news that people affected by MS need to know. My wife, Jean, lived with progressive MS for 23 years, so I've had a front row seat experiencing all the ways that MS can impact a family. I'm a past member of the International Progressive MS Alliance Scientific Steering Committee, and currently I'm a district activist leader and trustee for the National MS Society, and I chair the Society's California Government Relations Advisory Committee. The MS Society's Ask an MS Expert webcast is designed to give us a place for the MS community to connect and to connect you with experts who are ready to answer your questions on the topics that impact people affected by MS every day. Please feel free to post your comments and questions on Facebook, YouTube, or Twitch. MS Navigators are online throughout today's program, answering those questions and connecting you to resources. A study conducted by the University of British Columbia in 2017 found that one in four people with MS routinely use multiple medications on a daily basis. This is called polypharmacy. And managing multiple medications can be expensive, it's difficult to track, and it can increase the risk of unwanted reactions as well as drug interactions. Dr. Jackie Bainbridge is joining us today to give us a better understanding of this under-recognized challenge of living with MS. Dr. Bainbridge serves as a clinical pharmacy specialist at the Anschutz Outpatient Pavilion in the Neurology Clinic at the University of Colorado, Denver. Welcome, Dr. Bainbridge, and thanks for joining us. Thank you so much, John. I'm happy to be here and happy to talk about um, this important topic. Well, maybe a good place for us to start is with a definition. Can you define polypharmacy for us? Certainly. So really, when you break um, the word apart, poly means many. So when we're traditionally, as a pharmacist, when we're talking about poly um, pharmacy, our definition is really five or more medications. Um, there's also something called hyper polypharmacy, and that's where patients are taking 10 or more medications. It's important really to mentioned that we're not just talking about prescription medicine or traditional medications, but we're also talking about over-the-counter medications, herbal therapies, cannabis. Um, it, it's really vitamins. It's any, any agent that somebody is taking to treat a condition or even used for better health. And why are people who are living with MS at increased risk of polypharmacy? Well, in addition to their DMT or disease modifying therapy, we know that many of many patients with multiple sclerosis uh, or MS will actually be treating symptomatic problems as well. So very commonly um, we see patients with uh, multiple sclerosis having um, depression, uh, spasticity, um, pain, uh, neuropathic pain or um, pain symptomatology. And we talk, you know, uh, about bowel and bladder um, problems as well, urinary tract um, infections or antibiotics used to prevent uh, urinary um, tract complications or infections. So, um, so it's really important to pull in those comorbid conditions that commonly affects uh, patients with multiple sclerosis in addition to their disease modifying therapy that treats the disease state of MS. Do we know how common polypharmacy is among people who have MS? Well, going back to the study that you mentioned um, from 2017, so um, University of British Columbia with 1,400 individuals with MS, and um, they really found that one in four people were taking five or more medications per day, and one in 20 were actually taking 10 or more medications um, per day. And they followed those patients out um, for more than 180 days. 
They also found that um, that was uh, more common or polytherapy was more common in women. Um, and then those individuals who are of advanced age. So, um, you know, 60 and above, we noticed that those patients are actually taking more medications. Um, and they have, quite honestly, they have more um, comorbid conditions or um, other medical conditions. Um, and they're taking more medications. So, and you can also see that um, patients who are of lower um, income are taking um, somewhat less medications, and that's probably an affordability. Be and, and we also know that MS patients, um, in addition to this study, but uh, there have been studies published in the past that look at uh, the MS population um, and find that they are frequent users of something we call complementary and alternative medicine, so CAM therapies. And, that, and that's traditionally seen in our MS population. You know, we heard from Calvin, who's aware that taking a single medication has its own risks. And Calvin's wondering what happens when the number of medications he's on increases. Um, that's a really um, great uh, question. Um, Calvin, it's really very important that um, you have a pharmacist review your medication therapy. Um, we are the experts in um, drug therapy. Um, we spend so much of our time learning about um, drug drug interactions, uh, which is really important. Sometimes um, that uh, takes into account going back and reviewing how a medication is metabolized in the body. Most medications are actually metabolized in the liver um, and utilize something called the cytochrome P450 isoenzyme substrate system. Um, and that's basically uh, um, a way that our body metabolizes um, medications uh, and, gets, and gets rid of them. So it's really important that you have somebody with advanced um, education and knowledge on drug drug interactions, review your medication profile. Also, having said, you know, when we talked about MS patients, uh, really uh, kind of diving into the complementary and alternative medicine um, realm and the vitamins, um, et cetera, diet aids, um, you find that uh, you need, oftentimes, you need to communicate that. Um, information to your pharmacist. So they could actually keep that on your profile and look and screen when new medications are added for um, specific drug-drug interactions. Well, aside from the complications that are associated with increasing the number of medications someone may be taking, are there other factors that are associated with polypharmacy? So yeah. So um, when patients start going to uh, specialists um, and in addition to seeing their primary care physician, oftentimes uh, the specialist will add um, medications to their profile. Um, so that's really important to make sure that pharmacist knows about all the prescribers um, that a patient uh, has. You know, especially um, when you think about specialty um, medications, so medications that come from a specialty pharmacy, um, oftentimes our disease modifying therapy agents or DMTs will come from a specialty pharmacy, and that's not captured on your King Supers or your Walgreens um, profile unless the pharmacist asks about them specifically or um, the patient brings that up to the pharmacist. Um, a couple other situations that I can think of is um, if patients go to the emergency room and a medication is added at that point in time, um, or they're even admitted to the hospital um, and they have to go for rehabilitation uh, to another um, facility, a lot of times those medications don't get added to the um, profile. So it takes um, some extra dingy digging uh, on the pharmacist part, but it also takes the, uh, the patient kind of bringing that up to the pharmacist and uh, making sure that that's all captured in the patient profile. 
While there are risks associated with polypharmacy, sometimes it's necessary and, and there can be benefits. Maria told us she's on several medications that have improved her quality of life. And Maria's wondering if she should be concerned about her medication usage. What's the difference between appropriate polypharmacy and inappropriate polypharmacy? So, you know, it's, um, it's oftentimes that we think about managing those interactions. So oftentimes we want those interactions to occur. We utilize them on a regular basis. So I brought up the cytochrome P450 isoenzyme substrate um, system, and I know that's a mouthful. <laughs> <laughs> but again, it all boils down to how we're metabolizing drugs and most drugs in the world are metabolized by the liver. So oftentimes we'll use a medication that inhibits the breakdown of another medication um, and we use that to our benefit. Um, but the practitioner needs to know about it, the pharmacist and um, as being a, an integral part of the, uh, the patient care team uh, needs to talk through that with the uh, healthcare provider um, or practitioner that's that's ordering these medications. So oftentimes, again, we use those medications. Um, we know that that's what's occurring um, and, and we benefit um, from that. But you have to be aware that the interaction takes place or potentially could take place um, in moving forward um, for the patient. So again, we use that all the time to help our patients. Um, it also can lower costs of um, some uh, traditional or prescription regimen type uh, medications. Um, and, and oftentimes we're not gonna find a magic bullet. So we're not just gonna have one medication that can treat several comorbid conditions. Um, so, and sometimes we'll use um, several medications to treat one condition. Um, depression would be, uh, a, you know, one comorbid comorbidity uh, that I can think of that we oftentimes we use you know, different medications or multiple medications to treat that one um, condition. And, and that actually helps the patient feel better on that polytherapy uh, with multiple different mechanisms of action um, going to treat that one condition. Polypharmacy is more complex than just the number of medications a person might be taking. What criteria are used to identify polypharmacy? So um, again, it comes back to um, really an understanding and having a conversation with the patient. So um, you want to make sure that there's um, that all the medications that someone is taking, again, that includes those over-the-counter medications, um, there's an appropriate uh, indication. Um, also using um, therapeutic equivalents um, to treat uh, the same um, illness or concomitant use of inter interacting medications. Um, so again, using uh, medications in the appropriate dose uh, and making sure that the um, that you're not using an inappropriate dose to treat a specific um, condition. Um, and, and we try and stay away from using a medication to treat a side effect of another medication, if at all possible. So, um, so it is really complex. And again, um, it takes it takes a, you know, a pharmacist or an expert in those areas to really kind of tease out um, the interactions that are appropriate or not appropriate. I think uh, you've actually started to answer this next question a couple of times. I'm wondering, are there medications that commonly contribute to polypharmacy? And there are, uh, and we have we've touched on this a little bit, but Medications that um, that we often use to treat uh, central nervous system conditions. So, uh, if we're talking about um, antihypertensive agents, uh, those are very common um, and cause uh, multiple interactions. Also, when we're talking about antidepressants, um, they're notorious um, for interacting with other medications. There's a few that we know. 
uh, that we use in patients, especially of advanced age, uh, because they don't have as many um, interactions. Uh, also medications that are used uh, and that fall under that psychotropic um, uh, regimen. So uh, medications that are labeled as antipsychotics, we actually use those medications oftentimes to treat um, depression. So refractory depression or anxiety. So uh, we use medications um, from multiple different classes. Um, so uh, you don't want patients to get kind of hung up on a big class of medications because we use them for different symptomatology on a regular basis. Even medications that are anti-inflammatory. So non-steroidal anti-inflammatory agents uh, also can cause um, interactions or even affect the liver. So Tylenol has a tendency to affect the liver. So if patients, and believe it or not, um, log linear um, organ changes actually start to occur in um, early 40s. So I know that it just doesn't sound like it can possibly happen, but it does. And so we notice that the liver doesn't work as well in many individuals, not all individuals, but many individuals, and also um, your your kidneys. Uh, so we use our kidneys to eliminate uh, medications or the metabolites of traditional medications. So um, again, it's really important to think about the age of the patients. Um, what do their labs look like? How is their um, liver or kidney functioning? Um, and should you make adjustments to their medications, the dose or the frequency of somebody, of how somebody takes um, the medications? You know, when we started our conversation, we started off uh, talking about that study that said one in four people living with MS is taking multiple medications. So given those numbers, I'm hoping you can share some tips with us for best managing polypharmacy. Um, I would say the very first thing to do is to make sure that um, your medication list um, is up to date with, with your pharmacist um, and, and talk to your um, prescribing physician uh, or healthcare provider um, of any supplements patients are taking, herbal products, over-the-counter medications, um, uh, even cannabis. So many people think that cannabis can just be, um, and CBD so, um, as a you know part of the cannabis plant, think that there are no interactions and it's fine, it's all natural. But those particular medications, um, you know, need to be talked about and need to be on that um, updated profile. Um, also, it's helpful for um, patients to keep. Uh, their medications to fill like a medication box. Um, so fill it at the beginning of the week so that you make sure that you're um, staying adherent to therapy. So you're taking your medications um, when, when you're supposed to be taking them. Um, and that also helps to make sure that you're not taking uh, your medications um, too many times um, per day. So if you're just relying on that pill bottle, uh, and open, opening it up. Sometimes you're like, oh, did I take that noon dose or did I not? So um, having a good pill box is really, um, is pretty, pretty important. And also when you discontinue a therapy, uh, again, make sure that your practitioner and your pharmacist are up to date on um, what medications you stopped. If there is concern about a patient's polypharmacy risk factors, reducing or even stopping medications might be considered. This is something called de-prescribing. What's the process for that? And what should people with MS be aware of? So, um, you know, a couple things when we talk about removing a medication. So um, if you have um, medications that were um, interacting with each other. And one of those medications happens to be an enzyme inducer. So of the cytochrome P450 um, system or the metabolizing um, agents of the liver. So if you have an inducer on board, your serum concentrations of other medications are gonna decrease. 
you remove that enzyme inducer, those serum concentrations of other drugs may come may come up if they utilize the same metabolizing enzymes. So again, that's going to be really important to um, let your practitioner and your pharmacist know if any of those medications are um, have been stopped or something new has been started and added so that you can um, manage that particular um, interaction from occurring. Also, serum concentrations of many uh, medications um, can actually be uh, um, obtained. And that's another way to kind of judge um, you know, how a patient, if a, if a patient is getting too much of a medication or too little of a medication. Um, so serum concentrations can also be uh, very, very um, helpful. I think we often talk about the importance, and I've heard you mention the importance of making sure that someone shares their full medication regimen with their entire healthcare team. And it it certainly sounds from our conversation today that that needs to include their, their community pharmacist. Do I have that right? Absolutely, John. And, you know, in even having a list of your medications with you um, at all times, so in your in your purse or your wallet, um, even attached to your refrigerator. Um, it's a, a good idea to have an updated list. And sometimes we forget about updating this list, but it's really um, pretty important um, to do that. We've been talking about someone managing those medications that they may be taking. There are also situations, common situations, where someone else is responsible for giving someone those medications. What role can others play when they're caring for someone who's taking multiple medications? You know, going back to um, having uh, the pill um, box filled at the beginning of the week um, can be very helpful. Um, and we haven't really talked about this uh, so much today, but making sure, or, or sometimes making sure that if there's a medication available as an extended release um, preparation, that those can be prescribed by uh, the provider. Um, and so that could cut down on the amounts of time, times that patients are taking the medication. So that just increases or helps um, with adherence. And, and we do know that um, oftentimes patients will have a, a, even um, next door neighbors, next door kin, um, family members, uh, even social workers, et cetera, um, helping them manage those medications. But, um, you know, sometimes we forget to ask the provider if there is potentially an extended release formulation of um, a medication that uh, someone is on. Well, you've shared some great information with us today about a topic that everyone may not have been aware of before our conversation. So let me ask you, what would you say are the top three takeaways that you'd like our viewers to remember? Um, I would definitely say uh, to make sure that your medication is, list is up to date with your provider and your community pharmacist and um, somewhere on your person, whether that's your refrigerator, your wallet, um, uh, your purse. Um, definitely ask questions about your medications um, and making sure that you're talking to your provider about over-the-counter medications or new medications um, that have been added uh, to your profile. And then, and then I think, um, you know, adherence is also really important. So making sure that, um, you're taking your medication as prescribed and, um, and letting, and letting other people know of changes in your medications. And if you have any side effects from those particular medications, we always say, um, uh, at least in our practice, that the squeaky wheel gets the oil. So it, we don't know that you're having a problem and we may forget to ask you about a side effect or problem you may be having. So um, making sure that you're communicating that with your healthcare provider uh, and not taking 
you know, taking matters into your own hands, but asking for assistance with your medication therapy. Well, I want to thank you for sharing your expertise with us with us uh, today, Dr. Bainbridge. I think we have time for, for one more question. Uh, we've heard from James, and he's asked us, what's the best way for him to track his medications, and what information should he be noting? And if I can tack on an, a, an addendum to James's question, are there tools available for managing and tracking your medication? Um, there are tools available for um, managing and um, and tracking your um, medications. Um, so definitely um, pill boxes, as we've talked about, there are actually um, men's caps that are a little more expensive, but they track when you open a pill bottle and it goes to your computer and you download that. Um, so, but that's, you know, pretty costly. Also, there are um, on smartphones, you can always set timers and there are timers that are specific to um, uh, medication um, tracking or when you should take your medication. So that's really um, uh, pretty important. There are also um, information pamphlets that are given out at the pharmacy. And, and sometimes your community pharmacy will have um, like a calendar um, that you can actually use to track when you've taken um, a medication. So those can be valuable, um, valuable assets for patients to track um, their medication. You know, and I should, you know, also mention that, um, that oftentimes our MS navigators um, through the foundation um, can be very, very helpful in helping patients find the right tool or the right um, avenue for them to make sure they're being adherent with their um, medication um, therapy. And there's so many good resources um, on uh, the National MS um, website and CMSC. Well, I want to thank everyone who submitted questions today, and thank you for being with us, Dr. Bainbridge. Thank you so much. Before we close, I want to remind you that the National MS Society's MS Navigator Team is your best partner when it comes to connecting you to the very best information and resources on living with MS. You can reach an MS Navigator by phone, email, or through the Society's website by chat. For information and resources on MS, please be sure to visit the Society's website. You'll find research updates and news, information on connection programs like self-help groups and MS Friends. You'll find ways for you to get involved, and you'll hear about upcoming events that are taking place near you. Remember, you can connect with the National MS Society and others affected by MS on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, YouTube, and LinkedIn. And I hope you'll join me every week on the Real Talk MS podcast, where I continue the conversation that we start here. You'll find Real Talk MS at realtalkms.com, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, Amazon Music, or wherever you find your favorite podcasts. I'd like to thank Dr. Bainbridge for joining us today. Please remember that a recording of this webcast will be available at the Society's website at nationalmssociety.org slash msexpert, as well as on Facebook and YouTube. I hope you'll join us at this same time for next week's edition of Ask an MS Expert. You can always find our upcoming program topics on the National MS Society's website. And now I have a favor to ask each of you. Getting your feedback on today's webcast is important. So if you're watching on Facebook Live, you'll see a link to a survey pinned to the comments section. And on YouTube, you'll find that link in the program description. Completing the survey makes a real difference. The information you provide helps us continuously improve, and it helps shape future programs. The survey takes just one minute, so I hope you'll take a minute to fill it out. On behalf of Dr. Jackie Bainbridge and the National MS Society, I want to thank you once again for joining us. Please stay safe and make healthy choices.